I realize that some people are feeling a bit sad today as they see the snow coming down and it dampens their spirit a little bit. And I appreciate in some ways where you're coming from. However, I, I belong to a Facebook group and they're rejoicing in this because they're looking at it as an opportunity to do a different kind of fishing. When you look at the Facebook group and you will see all of the posts of the past year and the fish that they caught while on the ice. And so they can't wait for the water to freeze over so they can go back out and catch all of the fish that I didn't catch this summer. <laughs> which is a significant amount, actually. <laughs> actually, it's nicer to talk about the fish I didn't catch than the fish that I tried to catch. And I think that's an upset about that. So, people are sad, and, and I try to uh, at least understand where they're coming from. Uh, I will say that I'm looking forward to the next season, and that's just that kind of warp mentality that I have even though it's cold. But what I find really sad though, is the division that we see all around us. The divisions in society, for example, and how it pits one group against another. The divisions in community, the divisions in the world, it's terribly tragic as we see the images of the different wars that are taking place and the humanity which is caused by the divisions. But also I'm saddened when I, I see and I hear about divisions in the church as well too. Especially when I consider how God has performed this great miracle. It's one of the greatest miracles aside from Jesus coming and giving his life. And that is the miracle of being able to take people from different perspectives, from different walks of life, with different attitudes and different cultures, and bring them together in unity. When we look at the New Testament teachings of the book of Ephesians, and we see that the, the center of what Paul was talking about was this great miracle of how, through Jesus, God took the Jewish people and the non-Jewish people who were enemies and brought them together in unity. And the wonderful thing about that, I was going to say the neat thing, and that's a good word too, is he's still doing that today. He's still uniting people today. What a wonderful thing to think about. And as we explore this topic, which comes to us in Ephesians chapter 4, let me read a few verses that it's based upon here. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, starting at the first verse. As a prisoner for the Lord, I then urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with not one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So God has united us, just as He is united he has united us. And nonetheless, we are all different. Just as different as the clothes we wear this morning. There's one unifying fact that I found this morning, and that everybody wore a jacket, which indicates, in my mind, wisdom. But nonetheless, we're all different, and yet we're united. The other day, Ruth put together the piece. You remember the pieces of the puzzle that I gave you? Well, she put them together, and they're up here in front of you. But there's something to be remarked about the puzzle, and that is 
Number one, somebody ate part of the puzzle. <laughs> and I just wanted to encourage you, if you're that hungry, the snacks are there. Please help yourself. The second thing is that there are pieces missing. I guess somebody felt incomplete without that puzzle piece and they needed to take it with them. But what you will notice is this, that's a perfect illustration of unity in diversity. Each puzzle piece is different. And yet they all work together to form this, well I was going to say beautiful picture, I'm going to leave it as interesting. <laughs> but there are pieces of the puzzle missing. Which is a reminder that when we don't come together in the Lord, there's a part of the picture that is missing. And it's a very important part. And it's incomplete until we all come together. So it's a really good illustration. I appreciate it. Her work is very diligently to put a 100, or excuse me, a 97 piece puzzle <laughs> together. Unity and diversity. That is the church. That is the church in itself right there. A number of times, Judy and I have gone down to the Black Hills of South Dakota. When I first went down there, and I was thinking, where are the Black Hills? I was expecting black, but no, it's the pine trees and how dark they are. And that gave, a, gave this name to that particular region, the Black Hills. They're covered by swaths of pine trees. However, out of necessity, they are being recreated. And they are becoming more resilient. And they're becoming more diversified. Out of necessity. And now they have different types of evergreen trees that are planted in the Black Hills. And so when you look at the Black Hills, you will see the darkness of the evergreen, but you can notice different shades of darkness. And you will notice that not all the bark is the same, and not all the leaves are the same, because there are different diversity of evergreen trees, and yet they're all evergreen. So this diversity gives strength to the forest. God has brought us together through Jesus. He has united us in Jesus, and yet we remain different. At least that's what my wife says sometimes when she says, boy, you are different. <laughs> Is that a compliment? <laughs> Obviously it would be. What else would she have to say about me? <laughs> the teaching of Ephesians chapter 4 tells us that the church is unified and yet different at the same time, and that's a good thing. I remember, I remember back in the late 1970s how colleges and institutions, including, including Bible colleges, there was a push to create uniformity and conformity of believers. Now this was nothing new. As a matter of fact, this has been going on for centuries. But nonetheless, I remember this distinctly because that's when we went to Bible college. And there was a problem with that. And that was that the generation that were trying to instruct us and create this uniformity and conformity were encountering some of the most rebellious people. One of the things that, that uh, our generation, my generation was noted for, was the rebellion. What did we rebel against? You name it. We rebelled against it. And so this generation of people who believed that conformity was a good thing were trying to instruct a rebellious generation. I have to admit I felt very sorry for them. I really did. I mean, think about it for a second. You're taking people, and let's look at some of the highlights, some of the things that were popular in the 40s and 50s. Okay, here's a few things that were popular in the 40s and 50s. Uh, Lighthearted comedies. If anybody's watched old black and white TV and you'd see the lighthearted comedies that they really enjoyed, or well, we really enjoyed as well too. Here's another thing. This was cutting edge gangster movies. Oh my heavens. Al Capone. Or how about this one here? Blockbuster musicals. 
These are the things that mark that generation. Here's a movie that was scandalous with Clark Gable and Vivian Lee. Gone with the Wind. Scandalous movie. It had this, this sentence in the movie, frankly, Scarlett, I don't give a hoot. <laughs> or something to that effect. It was shocking. And then they encountered us. This rebellious group of young people that came into the college thinking, no, we're not going to have any of that. And the harder they pushed, of course, the harder we rebelled. It seems that our society has not learned the lessons from the past, and in many ways are trying to do this all over again. And they're looking for conformity. Conformity to the, the new ways, the new ideas, the new concepts, which are really nothing more than the old repeated over and over again. And as such, we as Christians are labeled intolerant because we refuse to change our values, our beliefs. We're intolerant because of that. I read this statement the other day by a fellow by the name of Tim Keller. And I really like how he put it. Look at this. So tolerance isn't about having or not having beliefs. It's about how your beliefs lead you to treat people who disagree with you. You get that? It's not about not having beliefs. It's about how your beliefs lead you to treat people who disagree with you. So we get back to the unity of the church. And we, we see that uni unity is not conformity. It's like we didn't all come here today wearing loud Hawaiian shirts <laughs> and no socks. Let me tell you, if you dress like that, we, we can get socks for you. It's very cold out there. <laughs> I had a friend, uh, a fellow co-worker, who came every day to work in a Hawaiian shirt. And he'd look at me and I'd be dressed in my dark blue, my dark gray. Do you get, you get the picture there? We are two completely different people. And he'd say, do you want one? And I'd go, no thank you. I appreciate the offer. offer. Nonetheless, we worked well together. We didn't have to be the same. In the church, it's like that. We don't have to be the same. As a matter of fact, we can be very distinctively different. And yet, we can work together. We don't have to think the same. We don't have to always vote the same way or do exactly the same things. That's not unity. That's conformity. So what makes a good church? Conformity or unity? Jesus said this, and it's recorded in John chapter 13, verse 34. I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as much as I have loved you. Your strong love for each other will prove to the world that you are my disciples. That's what he said. Not conformity, not uniformity, but unity through love. Now let's just say, for example, that you were the devil. And sometimes you might look at it and say, that's not a stretch. But we're going to stretch it a little bit this morning. And you're looking down at an effective church that is bringing glory to God, where the people are loving each other unconditionally. How do you stop that? How do you bring that to an end? Would you take away their building? It's a nice building that we have. It's a really beautiful building. But you know over the centuries that has been tried. And what happens is the church gets stronger. It goes underground and it gets stronger. Would you eliminate all of its programs? Well, the programs are there to bless and benefit other people. But the programs are not the essence of a church. No. You don't attack those things. What you do is you mess with unity. That's what you do. Is you mess with unity. Because once you mess with unity, and you mess with love, 
That's when the church starts tearing itself apart. Jesus said, your strong love for each other will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So you mess with the love that they have for each other. And you encourage division. And it doesn't have to be division over big major points. It could be a lot of little points, a lot of little different ideas, but you mess with that and you get people to focus on what divides. So now we take these words of Jesus and we put them together with the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, where he says this. He says, be completely humble, gentle, and patient, bearing with one another in love. And therein we find the attitudes that are necessary to encourage and build up unity. Let's take a look at these attitudes for a few, a few minutes. First, the attitude of humility. <coughs> Let's state it right now that humility has been misunderstood for thousands of years. Thousands of years ago, they didn't understand what humility was all about. The Greeks, and this letter is written in Greek, did not even have a word for humility. It was the Christians who made this compound word, and the word is tapianophrosuna. They took several words and they put them together and they created this word. And the word tapino was one that the Greeks would use to describe a plant that creeps and crawls along the ground. That's the idea they had about humility. The Greeks thought that humility was something that was trembling, that was mindless, that was shrinking, that was spineless. Do you get the idea that they really didn't think highly about humility? They despised humility. But it was the Christians, it was the church that it, who embraced humility because they saw the example of Jesus. And so they added to the word tapionos, the word frosun. And frosun describes the quality of self-control, of, of soundness of mind and thought, and of discretion. And they put these two words together and they said, this is what humility is. <coughs> To the Philippians in chapter 2, verse 3, Paul stated, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but to the interest of others. There is a description of a humble attitude. Humility in that sense there is thinking realistically about ourselves, and adding to that a willingness to learn. It is in, sense, in essence, I'll talk about three different things that make up humility. So when we say the word humble or humility, it's several different things. First, it's a willingness to learn. John Maxwell calls it a teachability. And he says that teachable is a willingness to listen to other people, to learn from other people, and to apply the lessons that we learn. So a healthy humility is both a sense of confidence and a willingness to learn. If you go to school, you go to school because first you feel confident that you're going to be able to learn something. If you went to school and said, I'm not going to get this, well, you're not going to get it. That's not humility. Humility is saying, I want to learn this. I'm going to do everything I can to learn this. That's humility. That's confidence and humility. The humbling part is when we say, I want to learn this, and therefore I'm going to listen to other people. I'm going to learn from other people. And I'm going to apply the lessons that I learned. I marked down a number of things, and I put them on the slide. There's a slide right there qualities of being teachable. Now, I want to point out that you'll notice that some of them are underlined. I did that for me. When I was going through this list, and I went, okay, this one I need to focus on today, this one I need to focus on. I could have gone through that list and said, I need to focus on every single one of them. 
but I chose three for myself to get an understanding of where I'm at today, too. But the qualities of being teachable. Am I willing to listen to other people's ideas? It's not all about me. Other people have things that they can suggest and teach me. What's the second one there? Do I listen more than I talk? I could have underlined that one, too. And then the third one. Am I open to changing my opinion based upon this new information? Or is my mind closed and I go, I don't need it, I don't want it? The next one, that's when I highlight it. Do I readily admit when I am wrong? We're not going to go down that too far. You think about that. It's not about me. The next one, do I observe before acting on a situation? I describe that as being proactive instead of reactive. I see something that happens, I respond. What are my feelings? I see something that happens, I sit back and I look at it before I react. Do I ask questions? And then it comes to the next one. Am I willing to ask a question that will expose my ignorance? Am I willing to be vulnerable in that sense? Am I open to doing things in a way I haven't done them before? Am I willing to ask for directions? Guys, enough said about that, right? We don't want to labor, belabor that point. And then do I act defensive when criticized? Or do I listen openly for the truth? Do I stop and think? And then I put down four steps of learning. They're really easy, but they're hard. What are the four steps of learning? Might be on the next slide. Step number one, act. Do something. Number two, look for, look at your mistakes and evaluate. Number three, search for a way to do it better. And what's number four? Act. It's great to learn something, but unless we apply it, what good is it? Really? A new worker shows up at a work environment in a shop. He's just come out of college. He's learned all sorts of wonderful informational material. And he comes with the attitude, I know what I'm doing. And the old timers here have nothing to teach me because I learned all the new stuff. I'm better. Does that make him a good worker? Is he willing or has he stopped learning and saying, I've got it all, and I'm going to give the answers? No. The best attitude to have in a work environment is being willing to listen to people who've been there and who've learned from their mistakes and want to teach and help you. That's the best attitude. That's a good worker. So, being confident and yet being humble. Secondly, humility is willingness to lift up God. Or thirdly, to recognize that we need God and depend on God on a daily basis. A humble person sees the reality of God and depends on God. You see, in that sense there, confidence and humility go together, hand in hand. Again, let me give you this statement by Tim Keller. The Bible tells us that we are so sinful, Jesus had to die for us. Oh, I feel bad. Yet, I am so loved and valued that Jesus was glad to die for me. Wow, that makes me feel special. This leads me to a deep humility and a deep confidence at the same time. I can't feel superior to anybody, yet I have nothing to prove to anybody. You see that? Confident and yet humble at the same time. And then the second quality is gentleness. Now the King James referred to gentleness as meekness. However, the meaning has changed so much over the years, we don't use that anymore, we use the word gentle. Nonetheless, either of these words could fully describe what Paul is trying to talk about. And so he uses the word, the Greek word, 
Fraotes. And this word, like I said, has no real equivalent in the English language. For the Greek people, it meant a sense of balance between too little and too much. For example, when we get angry, sometimes we get angry and we respond with rage. We get really angry, we get upset, and we let it flow out of us. Sometimes we get angry and we hold it in. We don't do anything. What Paul is saying is the right balance between the two. It's the balance between too little and too much. And he said that is gentleness. And this word has wonderful imagery behind it as well, too. For example, in the New Testament, this word was used for medication that would calm and soothe you and make you feel better. But we know that too much medication can be devastating and too little <coughs> Well, it doesn't have the effect that is needed. So the word gentleness is this idea of the combination of the two and finding the right balance. Has anybody ever heard of a person by the name of André René Roussimov? No? Maybe you've heard of André the Giant. Okay, that's who it is. André the Giant was seven foot four inches tall. He weighed 525 pounds. He was a professional wrestler because really he couldn't do anything else. But by his friends and his family, Andre was described as a gentle, kind, caring, loving person. Powerful and yet gentle and kind. That's the balance. That's the balance. Under God's control, we can have, and we allow God to build this balance into our lives by going back to the steps of being willing to learn and then acting on what we learn. And then the third one is patience. And some of you may be asking, why am I taking so much time to focus on all of these big words used by Paul? Well, because we get the deeper meaning. So again, this word patience, and I'm going to try to tell you what this word and how it sounds is Amkothumia. So I can say, what's the word? Well, because it's a very special meaning for it. Because for the Greeks and for the Romans, it had a different meaning altogether. He combines the two. For the Romans, this meant resilience. You see, for the Roman person, although they might face catastrophe, they would never face defeat. That's what they believed. They believed they might lose the war, but never, they, the battle, but never the war. They would never, ever admit defeat. And that's what that word meant. It meant resilience. For the Greeks, it meant endurance. That they would endure much. And it was the strength to not take revenge, to not retaliate. So, endurance. We had a dog, a uh, real sweet dog, a lab shepherd. It was my favorite dog. Don't tell my current dog that. It, he would get very upset. This dog was such a beautiful dog. She was so protective of her family. And yet, when our grandkids came along, they would jump on her, pull her ears. They would torment her in so many different ways. And yet, she would lie there and take it. Even though she had the capacity if she let out one growl or one bark or one bite, she could stop all of the torment and torture, but she didn't. She had that control. See, following God's example, we can ask Him for the ability to show this kind of resilience, this kind of endurance, this kind of patience. And then over all of this, if we read that in as we read through Ephesians and we say, you know, and he says, make every effort to keep the unity of the, of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And he goes on to say, complete humility and gentleness and patience. And then he adds this, bearing with one another in love. And love is the essential ingredient for all of these qualities, all of these virtues, all of these attitudes. And again, the Christians redefine this Greek word, agape. And what it means is un unconquerable love. 
In Romans chapter 5, and verse 5, it says, And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our own hearts through the Spirit who has been given to us. And in Colossians chapter 3, and verse 14, And over all of these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And may I just paraphrase 1 Corinthians. Humility, gentleness, patience, and love. And the greatest of these is 